This program made possible in part by... As a SEFQ member, you're making a difference. Because your money stays right here, helping your neighbors and supporting your community. Research is the cure for cancer. Peoria has the people, the plan, and the potential. And now, we will have the place. We expect the Cancer Research Expansion Project alone to generate approximately $35 million of new revenue for the Peoria economy. Today, we are here to celebrate this state-of-the-art facility. The day cannot come soon enough that chemotherapy and radiation are consigned to the dustbin of human history. This is a great day for our community. This groundbreaking has its foundation more than 50 years ago. When the town of Havana, Illinois needed a physician, Jack Gibbs took his new Doctor of Medicine license to Mason County. He soon learned other small communities needed his medical skills, but the distance between towns proved time-consuming by car. To shorten the time, Gibbs utilized his pilot's license in order to deliver care more quickly to his far-flung patients. After five years of caring for so many residents in outlying areas, he penned his impressions on rural health care. I became aware of a physician shortage developing in downstate Illinois, uh, as all the many of the small communities that always had doctors no longer had doctors, and also that uh, we needed a hospital there if I was going to do obstetrics and if we were going to uh, uh, be able to uh, provide medical care the way we felt it should be provided and not uh, have people go out of town for their care. He took matters in his own hands and spearheaded a successful effort to establish what became known as Mason District Hospital. Today, the hospital's surgery wing is named after him. His writing about the doctor shortage would soon garner more attention as it was published in a medical journal. As a result, he joined several medical committees that met in Chicago. Once again, his love of flying served him well in his trips from his practice, by this time in Canton, to Chicago. In time, a state commission concluded that physician education must expand beyond the state's five medical schools, all of which were concentrated in the Windy City. That stimulated some discussion uh, as I recall, there were state funds appropriated to um, do a study, and the study was called, was uh, headed up by a fellow by the name of Campbell, who became the dean of Rush Medical School. The Cam and they issued the Campbell Report, which was a state report, and the recommendations of that uh, report were that there should be several downstate medical schools. It was recognized that physicians uh, tended to settle in locations close to where they did their training, both medical school and residency. And uh, so it made sense to uh, try to increase the manpower needs in central Illinois or downstate Illinois to have a downstate school. And at that time, they had not yet decided where the campuses would be of, of, of the University of Illinois. And because of my involvement with this area, I really uh, lobbied hard for uh, Peoria as one of the sites. It was the beginning of what would become the University of Illinois College of Medicine at Peoria. In 1970, 
when the doors first opened, there were no classrooms and only a two-room office. And the first employee was not a doctor. We were in the, uh, on the fourth floor of the First National Bank building. And we had, uh, a, I guess it would be called a suite. There were two rooms that we started out with. And then we added one more room next to us. Then we moved to the Bradley campus, Burgess Hall, and adapted it to our use. Um, we had the um, whole first floor, and then I believe, we, yes, I know we did, we had labs up on the second floor. So it was still a residence hall right on, up in the upper floors, but we were had the lower part. The Bradley University location was temporary until a new facility could be built. The University of Illinois had leased land and received permission to build the school along Gale Avenue between University Street and I-74. However, the Peoria Medical Society recommended the school be built in close proximity to the two downtown hospitals. Arguments over location ensued when Peoria Mayor Dick Carver became involved. First, we had the College of Medicine in Chicago who thought they already had a decision, and they did not want to undecide. He was very upset <laughs> that the site was going to be what was then described as mutually inconvenient to everyone instead of having the site downtown and close to the major hospitals. Clearly, it was going to be very expensive. There were all the businesses on Main Street. There were all the homes that existed behind those businesses on what was Second Avenue, now Martin Luther King. And then there was the time. How long would it take to actually clear a site to build a medical school? None of those things were solved when I started the process of figuring out, could we in fact make this happen? The city needed a quick source of money in order to locate the school downtown. Carver turned to the federal government, asking Warren Butler at the Department of Housing and Urban Development for financial help. But at that time, Warren looked at me and basically said, we don't have any money. The president has impounded every single dollar of urban renewal funds, so we have no funds to give you. Well, I, I wasn't very clever, so I almost cried on his lap and went through a long story about what we needed to do and why it was important. Uh, and without going to the details, because I don't remember all of them, frankly, um, we eventually got that grant. And Warren went the extra mile to find the money to make it happen. And I might tell you, it was the only new urban renewal grant that was made in the United States in that year. He was very intimately connected to the powers that be at, how, at HUD and was able to get a whole series of grants that other communities um, were not able to accomplish. The next obstacle was at the state level. The mayor would have to overcome the Capital Development Board's approval of the Gale Avenue site. Dave Leach accompanied the mayor on a visit to Governor Dan Walker. Dick Carver explained his frustration over that decision. And by the time he left, he had Governor Walker not only agreeing with his point of view, but Governor Walker then directed the Capital Development Board to hold a meeting, a special meeting, to review the decision. We went to the Capital Development Board, and by say we, I mean, I'm talking Dave Leach and me, and I don't recall who else. Uh, this was a pretty much an independent effort on my part, and um, made our case, and I, I don't remember the exact sequence of events, but they reversed their decision. Now, the School of Medicine, University of Illinois, Chicago, came down there and argued vociferously in favor of moving forward. But the bottom line was the Capital Development Board voted, and they voted in our favor. Groundbreaking at the 25-acre downtown Peoria location took place in 1974, with Governor Walker in attendance, and construction finally began on the new medical school building. But I was amused, as, as I recall, because 
those who were the most strenuous and vitriolic in trying to stop it all made the longest speeches at the groundbreaking. It was pretty funny. Education was already underway by this time, with the first class of 20 doctors graduating a year before the groundbreaking. The first uh, group of students, uh, they came for their final two years of clinical medicine. They had, there were 20 students, there were two large, three large hospitals with a thousand inpatient beds for their use, and then 300 doctors that were anxious to teach them. Um, so in many ways, I think they got a better education than some medical students, many medical students did. Today, all University of Illinois medical students attend first year classes at either the Chicago or Urbana campus, taking basic science courses like anatomy, physiology, and biochemistry. The final three years of medical school begin with White Coat Day at each of the campuses, Chicago, Urbana, Rockford, and Peoria. Incoming students don the white coat for the first time, emblematic of medical service. Students primarily study diseases in traditional classes in the second year, followed by a clinical environment the final two years. After you get out of medical school, though you have an MD or a DO behind your name, you're still not capable of practicing medicine. You must go through a training, a, an advanced training period that is hospital-based, where you are supervised. Minimally, in Illinois, that requires two years of hospital training. Residency lasts anywhere from three years, which if you're going to be like a general internist, which is my career path, to seven years if you're going to be a neurosurgeon. Then, if you want to be a cardiologist, a heart specialist, for instance, after your three years of residency, you would become a fellow. And then you would do another three years of fellowship. A form of residency has existed at hospitals for many years, as early as 1924 at OSF St. Francis Medical Center. But in order for residencies to be accredited, they must now be affiliated with a medical school. A licensed doctor supervises a resident doctor in one of 11 residency programs in Peoria. Nine of them are at OSF St. Francis. In this particular case, it's emergency medicine. The hospitals pay for the residency programs and additional training in fellowship programs. At OSF St. Francis, that cost is nearly $32 million a year. Federal reimbursement is not quite $20 million, so the net cost to the hospital is $12.5 million. That net difference is worth it in terms of growing your own, uh, building your reputation as an academic medical center. Uh, and if you look at the cost of that relative to what you would otherwise have to do to bring those kind of doctors and subspecialists to Peoria, you're going to pay. Pay now or pay later. And this is a better alternative. The creation of a residency program can actually lead to significant departmental growth and better care for patients, as was the case when the residencies in neurology and neurosurgery were established at OSF St. Francis. I think that all of our growth and development has by and large been very incremental, uh, except um, the, the really big jump, as it were, what was the development of residencies in neurology and neurosurgery in 1979-1980. It's, it's difficult to get a residency in either of those. Um, there's stringent requirements. So that, that was really a big step because the, having those uh, put us in, into an entirely different uh, recruitment pool in terms of hiring new people. If you have a residency program in those two areas, then people will consider uh, coming to your place for a job. The College of Medicine's newest residency and one of its largest residencies are both at Methodist Medical Center. The newest is in psychiatry to help meet the needs for physicians in that field. Two separate units at the hospital will care for adults and youth. The other residency, family practice began at Methodist Medical Center in 1973. It's a three-year program, accepting 10 new students each year 
for a total of 30 residents. Dr. Brian Klosterman, in the second year of his residency, is attending to marry a heart patient. A licensed physician, Dr. Jeff Lehman, is present to monitor Dr. Klosterman's treatment. Residency programs are just the beginning of the College of Medicine commitment to serve the community. Family practice residents first served at the Carver Health Center on Peoria's south side. That was a census tract at that time of 25,000 people who had, been de who had been declared medically underserved by the federal government. There were a couple of, um, of reasons for developing a center such as that. Number one was to take medical care to indigent folks. And number two is to be able to use that uh, environment for educating medical students and residents. Today, Dr. Greg Stoner facilitates four residency programs at the Heartland Community Health Clinic locations in Peoria. The residents help the federally qualified clinic provide care to an underserved area. The primary relationship between the uh, College of Medicine and Heartland is that we serve as a teaching site uh, for clinical rotations for internal medicine, uh, combined med-peds, OBGYN, and family medicine residents. And we also have our OSF Sisters Community Clinic, and both of those clinics take care of a large number of patients who do not have insurance or uh, re monetary resources um, for their health care needs. So many small towns 30 years ago didn't have doctors, or they had a doctor that was retiring and there was no one to replace them. And now the, the effect of having this, uh, college, this uh, medical school campus here, attracting those physicians to, to teach in Peoria, train, and then have those physicians filter out into this region has just profoundly affected this area. The primary role of the medical school was to, to graduate physicians who would stay largely in the Peoria, Central Illinois area, and I believe that's largely happened. So we don't have uh, a lot of the physician shortage issues that a number of other regions of the country or areas of the country do. And moving forward, I, I think we're going to be, as a region, in pretty good shape overall. In the last several years, the number of total residents that have graduated from our program 50% of them have stayed in Illinois. About a third of that 50% is here in Peoria. Another third is here in the central Illinois region, and the remaining third have then been distributed to other areas of Illinois. Even with the medical school, some small towns find themselves in need of doctors. That was the case in Princeville about five years ago when residents were about to lose their only doctor. Because of a special program at the College of Medicine, the community was able to fill the empty position at its clinic, the university's Rural Student Physicians Program, or RSPP, gives students early exposure to rural health care in hopes the students will choose a small town practice upon graduation. And so what we do in the third year, rather than uh, keep them in Peoria in our more tertiary care hospitals, is we will send a group of students out who select uh, to do this rotation and they spend six of their nine months that year in a rural community. Dr. Josh Schubach did his rotation as a student in Toulon and the Princeville opening occurred about the time he completed his residency. Because he had been in the RSPP, he already knew the differences between practicing in a large hospital-based setting and being a lone doctor in a small town. The amount of resources you have to do testing aren't there, so you have to rely on clinical skills, you have to develop clinical skills, you have to develop a confidence, you know, and a leadership in a practice that's smaller like that. You have to be in tune to the family-based, community-type style of medicine where, you know, you have to develop relationships, you know what's going on in families, not just individuals, that helps you determine, you know, what's best for that individual patient. 
Dr. Schubach had a five-year commitment to the Methodist Clinic in Princeville because he received financial help through the Rural Illinois Medical Student Assistance Program. He's put in the five years and likes the Princeville Clinic and plans on providing health care at that location for years to come. While lesser populated areas search for physicians to provide primary care, Peoria is able to attract specialty physicians because of the College of Medicine. It's not often understood that where there are teaching hospitals, there are physicians who are of the, the highest quality that are actually attracted to them, attracted to the challenge of teaching residents, attracted to the concept of scholarship or a scholarly environment. It's part of what we sell when we're trying to bring a physician in. The relationship that we have to the medical school and the relationship that they can have as a physician with the medical school is part of the sell. The other uh, aspect of the medical school is uh, it allows us to recruit some higher end specialties either through on our own or through the medical school that would be very difficult for us to support just at Methodist. Uh, we've gotten uh, an individual from Dallas that uh, is uh, known in the robotic field for gyne surgery, now the chairman of the Department of, of uh, Obstetrics with the medical school. Uh, we were able to recruit a pediatric cardiologist from Ohio State who had published, nationally known, uh, that heads the pediatric, cardi uh, pediatric cardiology program. The ability to attract and keep recognized specialists has paid off for Easter Seals. The College of Medicine at Peoria has partnered with Easter Seals on two programs. Stiffness in Jensen's legs causes her to walk in an unorthodox manner. But she's more mobile today than she might have been because of the College of Medicine's Dr. Andy Morgan. This collaborative program at the Easter Seals Cerebral Palsy Center has enabled Jensen to make significant progress. You typically see motor impairment in patients with cerebral palsy caused by damage to the developing central nervous system prior to birth. The work at Easter Seal simply, in my view, would not be possible without the partnership with the University of Illinois College of Medicine. We are privileged to have two developmental pediatricians actively engaged here at Easter Seals. Uh, and frankly, without the college, we wouldn't have them. In a separate section of the same building, Elizabeth tosses blocks on the floor. At first, such behavior might be frowned upon, but Elizabeth then looks for the blocks. Dr. Ronald Lindsay, the other College of Medicine pediatrician at Easter Seals, says it's a trait known as object permanence. It's a sign of progress for a child with autism, a condition that impairs socialization and communication skills. Elizabeth's father, Eric, says she has developed other new skills like clapping and kicking a ball. Through the partnership with the College of Medicine, Easter Seals has been able to triple to more than 200 the number of children with autism that it serves. Just like the diagnosis, the early diagnosis is important, so is early intervention, intervening early in the life of a child. So medical direction is critically important. Uh, we wouldn't have it without the college, and they ensure not only accurate and early diagnosis, but quality, ongoing treatment following diagnosis. Across the street from Easter Seals, children with completely different needs receive medical evaluations and care. It's a situation that requires a very gentle approach by Dr. Channing Petrock, because these children may be victims of abuse. It began when two physicians came to Dr. Albers, who was the pediatric department chair for the college at the time. Dr. Saving and Dr. Morgan came to me with the idea of developing a medical uh, facility that would evaluate, collect data on uh, victims of uh, suspected child abuse. And that was called the Pediatric Resource Center. And it seemed like it was a, a reasonable function for the Department of Pediatrics, um, since this was not something that, that uh, existed in the community already. Though there were certainly people in the community and agencies such as DCFS and counseling who were providing services appropriately for the children, there was not really a good consistent way for them to get um, rapid good medical evaluation and that's what the Pediatric Resource Center is all about. 
so they get a medical examination. But we also provide a great deal of case coordination for them, which is very important. That's anything from acute discussions with the parents on the phone uh, about what's going on, giving them some information, um, uh, doing some acute counseling in effect because it can be, be very difficult for the non-offending parent to, to think about their child having been abused. All the way to helping get the child very comfortable for the exam so that they're very cooperative and, and it's done in a very child-friendly manner. I think it's rare to have a pediatric medical center uh, the size of ours uh, in a community the size of, of, of Peoria. There are not many communities the size of Peoria that offer the full range of pediatric services that, uh, that we offer. And, and yes, I think we do have a, uh, a reputation uh, which is growing and developing and uh, uh, is something we can be pleased with. Like the Department of Pediatrics, the Internal Medicine Department at the College of Medicine found a segment of the public in medical need. It began under the tutelage of Dr. Michael Bailey, who pushed for several significant changes while he was dean during the 1990s. He helped put together an institutional review board that, that reviewed research community-wide rather than research reviewed by a board at St. Francis and a board at Proctor and a board at Methodist and a board at the medical school. Combined it into one large board, difficult thing to do, got it done. Uh, uh, he created the, the AIDS uh, um, uh, clinical care center that we have here in Peoria now. It's an educational opportunity for med students. The program helps reduce expenses to the local hospitals in regards to uh, reducing the amount of emergency appointments or emergency walk-ins and it also is a program that was definitely in need. Numbers grew very quickly once the program got up and running. The center began in 1994 with 30 clients, but by 2010, as the only full-service HIV AIDS center in central Illinois, its roles had swollen to 558 unduplicated clients. The HIV AIDS center began while the College of Medicine's current dean, Dr. Sarah Rush, was the chair of the internal medicine department. And this is an important service for us, not only because of caring for the people that are involved, but also because it's so important to emphasize uh, prevention um, and early diagnosis in this disease. And so the university has played an important role uh, in uh, providing that service to the community. We provide medical care, case management, mental health counseling, uh, nutritional support, and we have a peer education program. We also have outreach, which is education and testing. One primary way that we measure success, that we can say that there's been success is seeing the decrease in the number of deaths that we've had annually. Uh, five years ago, we were experiencing 15, 16, 17 deaths a year, and we were down two years ago to eight deaths in one year. The College of Medicine's community involvement extends to the promotion of research at the Peoria Next Center, where Dr. Rager was the first president. So the idea was that we would all um, get together and, and not only promote uh, more research uh, in our community, but out of that would come uh, new small business, perhaps major industries over time. The College of Medicine has made research news on its own. When Dr. Rager was named dean in 1999, one of his first duties was to give more prominence to the laboratory. As he set out to recruit staff, he met cancer researcher Dr. Jasti Rao. I was of the mindset that I needed to be searching out and beyond our walls uh, to find some uh, basic science uh, uh, researcher. When uh, Zoom Din, who was a member of our uh, neurosurgery faculty, brought Dr. Rao here to give some lectures. After the lectures, he introduced me to Dr. Rao. Uh, a couple of months later, Dr. Rao asked to come and uh, talk to me more. He and Dick Lister, who was working with him at the time, recruited Dr. Josty Rao here from MD Anderson Cancer Center in Texas, which is one of the leading 
cancer centers and research centers in the world. And um, I, was in a, I was able to secure some money to help bring Dr. Rao here. Well, Linda Daly was there who worked for David Leach. And she says, well, uh, we're having a Republican fundraiser at the Country Club of Peoria tonight. Uh, and Lee Daniels, who is the, the state uh, majority leader of the House, is going to be there. Why don't we hit him up for some money? He called me on the phone from his car after the meeting and said, I think, I think I've secured 500000 for you. Next morning, got a call from the governor's office and asked me where to send the check. So uh, 500000 uh, about three weeks later, having conversations with, uh, with uh, Michael Bryant and Keith Steffen, they each ponied up 250000 The $1 million was enough to attract Dr. Rao to Peoria in 2001. His research team studies how to prevent the growth of cancer cells. They have been successful in shrinking tumors in the laboratory. The next phase is to test the method in humans. Well, phase one clinical trials means we are going to test 10 or 15 uh, human patients of uh, mainly GBM, glioblastomas, and see if there's any toxicity. Glioblastomas are brain tumors. Cancerous cells continually grow by attracting blood, thus depriving adjacent normal cells of nutrients. Cancer cells also release molecules that digest healthy tissue. And so what he studies is how do cancer cells signal or communicate or change the body around them so that they can continue to grow. Dr. Rao's team is also performing research with stem cells from donated umbilical cord blood, although they have not progressed as far with this method. Oh, we are isolating the stem cells, mesenchymal stem cells, and in those stem cells we start injecting in pre-established tumor growth in mouse models and see whether we are inhibiting the tumor growth. Jesse Rao, the lead researcher here, has more NIH grants than any other researcher in the United States. Not Mayo Clinic, not MD Anderson, uh, but the U of I College of Medicine in Peoria has a researcher with more NIH grants than anyone in the country. Well, Dr. Rao is the premier researcher in cancer of a handful of researchers in America. And he's right here in Peoria. And we knew that in order to keep him in Peoria, we had to provide the kind of facilities and dollars and opportunities so that he would stay here and that we could build on the kind of research that he was doing. Efforts to expand space for Dr. Rao's research team were announced in 2007. Groundbreaking took place in August of 2010, and the facilities have taken form on the main campus. As many as 50 additional researchers will be added to the research staff to study the molecular, cellular, and genetic characteristics of cancer. The expansion of cancer research into the new $13 million building will allow other researchers at the College of Medicine to move into the vacated cancer laboratories. Dr. Ken Ficucci's team is studying the development of Alzheimer's disease. He believes amyloids, which are a buildup of protein in the brain, can cause tangles and lead to Alzheimer's. He thinks the amyloids initiate neurodegeneration, and if you remove the amyloids, the tangles disappear, thus eliminating Alzheimer's. After that, uh, developing the uh, accumulation of amyloid in the brain, we introduce that uh, genes for the, the production of antibody in, in the brain. And uh, that will be the therapeutic approach. Dr. Fukuchi's current research is on the animal model of Alzheimer's disease. There are still obstacles for his team to overcome before the testing is applicable to humans. Other researchers at the College of Medicine are investigating heavy metal toxicity, including the impact of depleted uranium on Gulf War veterans, multiple sclerosis, and fetal alcohol syndrome. Another expansion involving the College of Medicine is occurring on the OSF St. Francis campus. The Jump Trading Simulation and Education Center, SimLab for short, 
will use computerized mannequins to train doctors in techniques before they use them on patients. We can put the learners in uh, situations that are rare, uh, but they're very life-threatening, uh, low-occurrence, high-risk situations where they have to know very, uh, very accurately what they have to do. And there's no time to think about it or look it up in a book. These residents in the pediatric residency program are facing a situation where they must make quick decisions on how to treat a baby in respiratory distress. Okay, why don't you go ahead and check. Check the breath sounds. Mm -hmm. We got a good chest rise. Got a good chest rise, I hear breath sounds bilaterally. Okay, let's call for a stat x-ray and get the pick you on the phone. Roland controls the sequence of events by computer on baby and adult mannequins, including a pregnant woman. The Sim Lab is named for Jump Trading, a Chicago-based proprietary trading firm that donated $25 million. Roland hopes the new facility will go beyond just meeting accreditation council requirements to incorporate simulation training in residency curricula. We're hoping to have an innovation center uh, where we will pair engineering students with medical students or residents for the purpose of possibly designing new simulation devices or enhancing the ones that we already have. You're going to see a sim lab that offers research and training where doctors around, hopefully the country will say, if you want to be trained for this procedure or that procedure, you need to go to Peoria. The growth in programming options at the College of Medicine at Peoria has been accompanied by a growth in the number of graduates, especially females. There was but a single woman in the first class, but females now represent nearly 50% of graduating physicians, and a trend of the 1960s has been reversed. The state of Illinois had the reputation at that time of educating and exporting more physicians than any other state in the union. So, since all the medical schools were in Chicago, students took their education there. Many left the state to take their residency elsewhere and never returned. Over a 40-year period, 42% of College of Medicine at Peoria graduates have stayed in the state to practice medicine. Its College of Medicine educates more physicians than any other medical school in the United States more than any other medical school in the United States. And here in Illinois, one out of every six practicing physicians, one out of every six has a UI medical degree. At the same time, uh, the University of Illinois had a strong minorities program, a special track uh, for the minorities. So we began to see more uh, black and Hispanics uh, in, in our classes. About two-thirds out of all underrepresented minority physicians in this state are our graduates. So uh, we are proud of that. The College of Medicine has established mentors to help recruit, retain, and graduate physicians of color, especially African Americans and Latinos, through the Urban Health Program. They were really motivating, actually, you know, trying to encourage minorities to go into medicine in hopes that they would go back to these underserved areas and then serve the underserved populations where they came from. So I was really attracted to that concept and I decided to uh, come to the University of Illinois. Over the years, the College of Medicine has become more diverse, but I still feel that we have a ways to go. And sometimes it is about that wanting to talk to someone who has been through the process, who's of a similar background, and how did they manage? Um, the workload, how did they manage um, personal demands, family demands, and so forth. My advisor is uh, Dr. Connor Garcia. Uh, she's in internal medicine at OSF, and uh, she's also one of the advisors for the Urban Health Program, along with uh, Lorraine King, and she, they both help just to give support. They, they're there if we ever need it, um, in case we have problems with school. Martinez recently received the Jefferson Award, a national award for volunteerism. He was honored for co-founding a student-led project called HEARTS, Health Education Awareness Resource Teams. A program where we can go out into the community and educate people on basic health issues like hypertension, diabetes, stroke, 
and, and just pertinent issues that affect the community and, most people, and a lot of people in the community. Um, these are all diseases that are preventable with, with proper uh, lifestyle changes and diets and better living habits. And they're extremely effective at that, partly because they've just learned it and they're capable of talking sort of at the level of the patients because, they, because recently they didn't know it either. Um, and because when they're talking to younger people particularly, they can relate in a way uh, to them that perhaps some of the uh, more uh, senior uh, physicians cannot. But the students still can receive guidance from so-called senior physicians through a mentoring program. So the Senior, senior Scholar Program taps into these uh, resources of experienced uh, and mostly retired physicians to uh, mentor the students and uh, uh, really provide a uh, perspective in medical care that perhaps younger physicians or full-time faculty might not have. Dr. Campbell is a volunteer professor. Without the non-salaried volunteer faculty, the College of Medicine would not be able to operate as it does today. And the volunteerism began on day one. Uh, many, many physicians volunteered to become charter members of the faculty. There were about 200 or 300 physicians, I think, who signed up as faculty members. And then some of us took leadership roles uh, because of interest and availability. The volunteer faculty is uh an underlying uh, force to, in, in teaching in this, uh, in this school. Not all, not all schools are that way. They have many more full-time faculty. About 45% of the doctors who teach in the lecture halls um, are not being compensated by the medical school at all. They're doing that purely for volunteer reasons. Huge numbers of the uh, physicians who teach residencies in the residencies or in the outpatient portions of our third and fourth medical, uh, medical student year are also purely volunteer. And so what that is, I think, is a physician commitment to sort of train your next generation and a measure of the appreciation people have for the education they've received. Even with the high number of volunteer faculty, the College of Medicine has a big impact on the local economy. It certainly has attracted uh, many physicians to, to train here and practice here that might not otherwise have done so. Uh, it's uh, brought in a level of scholarship that would not have otherwise existed. It's brought in uh, funding that would have not otherwise existed uh, uh, through uh, academic salaries, through research grants, uh, and uh, other ancillary activities. So it, it has a significant economic impact on the community. It's an economic engine that Central Illinois nearly lost just a few years after it began. During the economic slump of the early 1980s, as state-imposed funding cuts loomed, the University of Illinois was reconsidering the multi-campus model. I think there was some argument about whether the concept of three satellite campuses to go with the main campus in Chicago was a correct a strategy. Um, I, I happen to not be in that argument because my uh, very parochial view was the School of Medicine here was the right strategy. Whether they should have had two more or not was not my business, nor is something with which I wanted to get involved. But the reality is it's been proven even in time that Jerry Newman fighting the idea of keeping it here was the right idea. I think the thing that really saved it was um, not only did the faculty pull together, but the other uh, forces in Peoria, particularly industry in Peoria, uh, civic leaders and the like, uh, actually uh, uh, came together behind the school and uh, legislators. Uh, and there were any number of meetings and folks who went to Chicago who to represent, who to, to represent the school. The three satellite campuses, in the broad view, serve three different purposes. Urbana students usually are on a research track. Rockford is oriented to family practice, and Peoria also includes specialties. Neurology and neurosurgery are two examples of Peoria specialties where there's a shortage of doctors in the country. Partly it's maldistribution, but in most areas in the United States, except for San Diego and a few towns like that, um, 
it's undersupplied, so we still have to produce. But you know, we we really got we we've, we've graduated about almost 20, 25 neurosurgeons from our program now, and you know that's 25 is small, but there's only 3,000 practicing neurosurgeons in the country. The College of Medicine's many programs are spread across numerous locations, from hospitals to urban clinics to rural health offices. But the education all began at the main campus building on Main Street in Peoria, which first opened to classes in 1976. The Family Medical Center was added in 1999, followed by the Illinois Medical Center in 2008, and the Cancer Research Center now under construction. While the physical plant has grown, seven deans have nurtured the program resources of the College of Medicine at Peoria. They each have left a unique mark upon the college. I think the best thing that Dr. Gritsonis did was to recognize that he had all these doctors around that were anxious to teach the medical students. And so he brought in a group of students within a year of his coming here. We had to then sit down and develop a curriculum and establish the program. If we hadn't had that motivation, uh, the students being here, I think we wouldn't have gone as forward as quickly as we did. And I think interest might have been, might have, might have waned among the volunteer faculty. So I, I, I think that was the key decision that he made that, and the most important decision in, this, in determining the success of the school. Dr. Newman was an internist, very well-trained internist who had practiced uh, internal medicine in Canton, Ohio, and uh, it's a town very much like Peoria, an industrial community about the same size with several hospitals and without a medical school. And he'd been the medical director at one of the large hospitals there, so he understood community medicine, he understood practicing physicians, uh, and I would say that was one of his primary uh, assets. I was asked to, uh, to be an interim dean when uh, Dr. Newman uh, retired and during the search process for Dr. Newman's successor. So I was still chairman of the Department of, of Pediatrics and uh, I, I think basically I warmed the chair. Uh, I, my primary uh, contribution during those nine months was to make the uh, building a no smoking uh, facility and I uh, caught a lot of flack for that. So I guess that's my my primary legacy. <laughs> the Family uh, Medicine Center, which uh, was built on the campus, was built uh, and occupied thanks to Michael Bailey uh, in collaboration with Methodist Hospital. And it was a nice model that, that we sought to replicate, and that is um, the university, the College of Medicine, uh, was strapped for funds, but what we did have was a nice piece of prime property right in the center of the city uh, that we needed to take advantage of. I think the biggest success uh, really was to create a research enterprise that uh, everyone told me couldn't be done in little old Peoria, Illinois. And so I'm, I'm proud of that. But I guess what I'm proudest of uh, the most uh, is, are the people uh, involved at the College of Medicine, Peoria, uh, who joined together to help get done all of these uh, difficult new uh, programs. Uh, both physicians, non-physicians, office staff. Um, I, I'm a, 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 a student of servant leadership and I tried to develop that model at the university and uh, I'm, I'm pleased to say it, it took hold. Well, Lorenz, uh, you know, stayed with the program uh, in, in the sense that uh, he picked up the ball with regard to uh, getting the Illinois Medical Center uh, off the ground and carried that forward very well. Uh, pleased me very much. Kept uh, Rao moving forward, assisted him as much as he could, um, and then uh, ultimately passed the ball along to Sarah Rush, who's, put, who's really ge generated a, a lot of enthusiasm for all of these efforts. Uh, I recruited Sarah Rush as a resident in internal medicine at St. Francis, lo, these many years ago. 
and I've been thrilled with her development over the years. And so uh, I think one of the, the best things that could have happened to the College of Medicine is for Sarah Rush uh, to now be the dean. So, and I expect uh, she'll, she'll uh, develop uh, all of the uh, segments, uh, whether it be service or research, uh, education especially, uh, more fully. And we'll have uh, larger residency programs, more fellowships and training, and she's already got the psychiatry uh, residency approved. For these deans, it was not simply a quest to create a school to educate physicians. It was a dream to enable an industry to grow stronger roots in central Illinois. They've now established a nucleus for the business and relationships with the community. Well, the college really brings uh, collaboration to life. Thanks to the partnership that we share with them, we're able to provide comprehensive, coordinated, and evidence-based care to children and families right here in Central Illinois. Dr. Rush has been very instrumental on, on talking more about who we are, what we do, how, how the College of Medicine impacts Peoria, but it also seems to me at least is she really understands that this isn't just a College of Medicine, but it's a business. And it's a business that has an extremely strong impact on a lot of different areas of our community. The healthcare enterprise, uh, second to Caterpillar, is the, the second largest uh, enterprise uh, in the region and probably will grow uh, substantially more uh, over time. Um, thanks in part, in large part, uh, to the University of Illinois College of Medicine. And yet, the College of Medicine hasn't always received credit for the many local services that emanate from this building. That may change with new residencies and fellowships, cooperative services, and expanded health care. This new construction is just an external sign of what originates from within these walls. A lot of people who come here to are recruited here are very surprised at the uh, resources that are already available uh, in, in the community. In the areas like family practice, psych, cancer, and some other things, I think we can be, you know, selectively. Uh, I think this community uh, and the medical school can, can really find a strong niche and play on a national stage. The more I learn about the College of Medicine, the more I am absolutely convinced that the quality of health care that we enjoy in this region uh, we enjoy in large part because of the role the College of Medicine plays. These College of Medicine students are about to graduate with their medical degrees. It's here at Match Day that they learn where their residencies, and thus their medical careers, will begin. A computer has matched them to available residencies around the country. For Mario Martinez, it means returning to his home in California, inspired by his Peoria experience. And so I feel I'm coming out of Peoria with a great education, a great background, and um, great clinical skills. From meager beginnings, where a dean and his administrative assistant began putting the building blocks in place, much grander ventures have developed in the past four decades. During this time at the College of Medicine at Peoria, the staff has learned there are lessons beyond medicine. I guess the ultimate hope is that 40 years from now when somebody looks back, they'll look back on what we did in this time period as uh, helping contribute additional building blocks to something that at that point will be even better and brighter.
This program made possible in part by... As a CEFQ member, you're making a difference. Because your money stays right here, helping your neighbors and supporting your community.